Hey everyone, hope you're settling into your semester well. Uh, welcome to the first online uh, at home lecture for Data Science 1. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, the what and also the why of data science. So data science is a pretty new field in general um, and the definitions and roles are, are very much still under development, uh, but at a, a broad brush view, data science is the extraction of general, generalizable knowledge from data. Um, this uh, sounds pretty succinct, but, but it's actually a very complex thing. Um, so uh, practically speaking, data science is a, a very interdisciplinary uh, study. Here at UVM, rather than being in any single department or college, uh, our data science program is, is hosted by the graduate college and is actually spans, uh, spans all uh, programs across UVM. Uh, most notably, uh, data science relies a lot on mathematics and statistics, um, as well as on computer science to, to build uh, programs and to build models to analyze data. Uh, but unlike either of those fields by themselves, it also relies very heavily on input from domain experts who are, are familiar with the problem. Um, we'll get into to the reason why that's so important uh, later on in the semester. Um, what uh, a data science project actually looks like uh, varies quite a bit. Um, and you'll see lots of different examples of diagrams like this that uh, that show the, the major steps of a data science project. Um, but uh, all of them share a, a very uh, similar broad, um, a broad set of steps. Uh, so uh, th this one in particular uh, starts with uh, the understanding of a problem. Um, so this is a, a one of the ways that data science differs itself from machine learning is that rather than being based uh, off of models and optimization were really based off of a, a real world practical problem. Um, we'll go out and, and mine that data, uh, collect uh, either in person or from a, a website uh, or an existing data set, uh, the data that we think we'll need for that problem. Uh, more often than not, that data will be uh, really messy with missing values, with incorrectly uh, labeled values, um, with, with all sorts of, of errors and confusion. Um, and, and it'll be our job to try and figure out uh, what, what the data should actually look like. Um, given that, uh, that we, we think we have some reasonable data to, to work with, um, we'll, we'll explore the data and, and look for um, any patterns or trends, um, really do a very open-ended um, look into uh, what what sort of uh, features we have and uh, and exactly how we think that they might relate to the problem that, that we've been tasked to solve. Um, chances are we, we won't have the, the features that we're, we're really going to care about, um, so we'll have to, to build those ourselves. Um, this process uh, called feature engineering we'll get into uh, more later as well. Um, given that we have uh, features in our data, uh, we'll build some predictive model that hopefully tells us something interesting about how the world works, uh, or at least how uh, this particular data set uh, works. And uh, what the last step in this process is to, to visualize the data, to, to share it and communicate with others. Um, now that this is a, a great example of, of what one of these cycles looks like, and I'll, I'll show you some other cycles um, or, or some uh, other versions of the same cycle. Uh, but, but a few things to note uh, at first here. Uh, the, the first is that uh, this uh, linear uh, cycle that, that's implied here uh, is almost never the case. Um, more often than not, we'll uh, get to our data exploration and realize you know, there's some other piece of data that that we're missing that's that's really important and we'll go back into the the data mining stage um, or we'll uh, we'll get to the feature engineering stage and realize that uh, that there's something uh, wrong that our data is is biased some way and we'll we'll go back to our uh, data cleaning stage uh, and, and um, try and and get data to a, a place where it's ready for uh, model building uh, we might uh, build a model and then realize that we need more data um, or even realize that, that we need to be asking a different question and, and go all the way back to the start. Um, and uh, especially visualizing the data afterwards 
um, what uh, what we might find is that that we need to redo any of these steps or or even go back to the very beginning and ask a, a different question. Uh, the the other big thing that I think is missing from this particular version of the life cycle uh, is uh, is maybe step number eight, which is uh, to to assess the the impact of this model or visualization on the real world. Uh, data science is is very much an applied field. Um, and part of that application is, uh, you know, making an impact um, on on some real world problem, um, and so whether that is a, 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 an artifact of how well your visualizations work, whether you're assessing uh, how well your model generalizes, uh, whether you're uh, assessing how much you can contribute to uh, a business understanding or um, a, a, a domain um, in the real world, uh, assessing the output of your model or your visualization is, is an important step for uh, the, the kind of ultimate uh, part of this cycle, which is that it, it repeats again and again as you refine the question that you're asking and the data that you're asking it with. Uh, here's a, another uh, slightly simpler version of the, the data science model. Uh, it still has the same major com components of, of getting data, cleaning them up, uh, doing exploratory data analysis, building a model, and, uh, and interpreting that or, or creating visualizations. Uh, the, the reason I, I like this, besides that the, the accompanying blog post talks a, a little bit about more uh, about how much time they spend in, in each of these, um, is, uh, is the focus here on, on the last step that we said was missing uh, previously about actually putting the data into use. Um, and and uh, maybe not explicit, but uh, certainly implied here is the uh, assessment of, of how good your model or your data science project is. Uh, and, and finally, uh, let's look at the example from our uh, textbook, uh, Principles and Techniques of Data Science. Uh, I like this because it goes into a little bit more detail on some of these steps uh, in particular, even if, if there are less um, overall. So uh, when we're talking about uh, the question or problem formulation, uh, the, the focus here uh, is really on the, the science part of data science. Uh, this, this relates both to our, uh, our hypothesis um, about uh, asking uh, what thing in the world are we trying to explore or explain? Um, and also to, to our final point from before about the about the metrics, uh, you know, what does it mean for a hypothesis to be true or not, or for a, a model to be useful or not um, in, in a particular domain? Uh, when we get to uh, data acquisition and cleaning, uh, this uh, clearly includes some of the, the data mining and collection um, process. Uh, but but also includes more about organizing and uh, and and uh, putting together the data into tables and formats that uh, we can use for our analysis. Uh, we'll get more into this uh, throughout the semester, um, and that there's lots of different flavors of how we can store data. Uh, but that that can be a challenge in itself. Uh, the exploratory data analysis um, is a, a big stage here. Um, asking uh, if we need to go back and, and do more data acquisition or, or ask different uh, different questions, uh, but but especially I like here that they uh, talk about looking for biases or anomalies uh, or, or issues with the data like like missing uh, missing values, but also talk about future engineering here, um, how we transform the data to make analysis uh, more efficient and more effective. Uh, and then finally, uh, prediction and inference. Um, this is uh, the the model building part of data science, uh, which it, which is really what we uh, talk about uh, in machine learning. Um, but but also uh, has a, a little bit of a an allusion to uh, the real world uh, application and the generalization when they they ask how robust the conclusions are from any given model. So, uh, so there's lots of different flavors of this. Uh, maybe the uh, the most uh, data sciencey way to to figure out what the actual uh, data science cycle is is to survey a bunch of data scientists. Um, so this uh, study from O'Reilly um, did exactly that, asking uh, a, a bunch of data scientists what uh, their uh, what the tasks they do on a daily basis are. Um, and uh, the exploratory data analysis is, is the biggest thing, but uh, a lot of the other steps that, that we've looked at 
um, including data cleaning, creating visualizations, um, feature extraction, uh, a lot of these data science-y things that we think about are, are in the top uh, few entries, uh, but also are the things that are, are less uh, on the machine learning side of data scientists and, and more on the applied human side of things, like communicating findings to stakeholders or identifying the problems that, that actually go into uh, a data science project. Um, so this is one of the reasons that that uh, you know we need such a d diverse and curious group of people uh, who want to become data scientists um, because it's it's not just uh, uh, an exercise in modeling but but it's really about um, learning about different problems in the world connecting with uh, domain experts and uh, in saying something valuable about about those actual fields. Another uh, aspect of data science that uh, is, is often not represented well in those diagrams. Uh, and, and this is one of my, my favorite slides from, uh, from Jim Bagro's uh, class, the, the prior instantiation of data science here, um, which is the, the breakdown of how uh, a data scientist actually spends their time. So uh, when, when we hear data science, we all often uh, think of it very much in the machine learning flavor of jobs or tools or analyses. Um, and, and I certainly uh, have this bias to coming from a machine learning background into data science, um, where the statistical analysis, the, the model building are, are really the, the key focus areas. Um, but uh, but in, in real life, uh, the, the models uh, are usually uh, pretty standard, often off the shelf models. Um, and, and the real challenge of data science is uh, is actually the collection of data, the pre-processing, um, getting data ready to feed into the models, and then on the other side, presenting and visualizing the the analysis, explaining what these models actually mean to uh, folks who who may not have a data science background at all. Um, and, and this is where I think a, a lot of the knowledge um, uh, about the the models and, and the machine learning and also the, the data collection and, and pre-processing uh, really shine through uh, when, when you're able to explain a, a model accurately and succinctly to, to someone who doesn't know anything about the processes that, that have gone into making it. Uh, so, so data science, uh, to reiterate, is, uh, is very different from uh, machine learning in uh, the, the fact that the data, data, the data itself is a, a huge part of, of this undertaking um, and what separates it from kind of classical mathematics and statistics into something that, uh, that actually is uniquely uh, different and, and important. Uh, so th this is a slide stolen from uh, the, the Data 100 class uh, at, at Berkeley, um, talking about uh, how this, uh, the, this data science trend um, fits into uh, internet uh, information technology uh, as we've seen it, and, and especially uh, the the internet as of late. Um, that uh, for for a long time in computing, uh, hardware was the, uh, the the main key innovation. Um, but as we saw companies focusing on software like um, Google and and Facebook and and Microsoft um, come up. Uh, the the value added um, in in uh, the the tech world is really on the, the software end and and uh, really as as internet companies um, Facebook Amazon Netflix um, began to uh, really connect uh, people together um, we we saw another big shift in in the uh, the major players and the major trends um, in uh, in uh, business and technology, um, and, and one of the things that we've seen throughout is uh, is increased access, uh, but but also increased data, um, and, and now we we are collecting uh, enormous amounts of data on on all of us all the time for better or worse, um, and and hopefully a, a lot of that information can be used um, not just for uh, you know selling ads or or selling products. Um, but for uh, you know, making informed decisions um, for the, the betterment of, of all of us um, and, and of us as a, a collective society. Um, so, uh, so, so looking forward, 
Um, the, the, the question is, you know, where, uh, where all of this data um, and, and predictive modeling can take us. Um, you, you see some uh, examples uh, on, on the right of uh, more of these AI-driven uh, trends, um, which, uh, which is, is maybe uh, the, the next step in, uh, in uh, potentially this trend of, uh, of data science being uh, really storage heavy. Um, one of the, the next things that come out is, uh, is really compute heavy um, projects and, and those include a lot of, of data science, but also a lot of machine learning and, and AI um, techniques and applications. Uh, data science, uh, another reason why uh, you all as, uh, as undergraduate and graduate students uh, nearing the end of your schooling might care about is uh, that these are uh, extremely valuable uh, skills to have and and because of all the value added that the data science can bring to a, a business or a research project um, they're uh, they're in very high demand right now um, famously uh, uh, a few years ago this was called the the sexiest job of the 21st century um, by uh, Harvard Business Review and in particular uh, DJ Patil who was our speaker yesterday uh, this comes out uh, through uh, the, the job market as well, that uh, the, the percentage of, of jobs posting uh, that advertise for data scientists uh, has been increasing drastically. Uh, in the, the last few years, we haven't uh, kept up exactly this exponential growth here, uh, but I wanted to show you this plot rather than some of the, the newer ones because uh, the, the interesting part of this, I think, is actually the, the flat line up until 2011. Um, showing kind of just how new and emerging uh, a field this is. Um, so it's it's really exciting um, to to be uh, kind of shaping and and uh, un uncovering a lot of what goes into data science uh, on the fly here as as we're all trying to figure it out. Um, but uh, but certainly a, an emerging field that that I think will continue to be uh, in demand for for a long time. Now this isn't uh, just a uh, an exercise um, for academics or or for selling products um, or, or you know any uh, of the many trivial applications I'm sure you can think of, uh, but but I think it is also something that has an enormous value to society uh, as a whole, uh, and I think right now the the stakes um, for data science are are huge. Uh, one example where we are collecting uh, enormous amounts of big data um, is uh, is the the current pandemic. Um, this has been, um, I, I think, a, a great example of uh, you know nationwide and worldwide uh, collective um, organization of uh, of of data science projects, uh, but especially uh, in delivering those insights into. Uh, policymakers and organizations to to try and make uh, informed and and better decisions from that, um, and the the health and safety outcomes here um, obviously uh, show the the potential that uh, being able to to work with data can can bring towards uh, towards problems for our society. Uh, speaking of problems with our society, um, uh, another. Uh, Problem that uh, is long-standing, but uh, but has been getting uh, lots of uh, attention recently, as it should, are uh, are racial uh, biases, um, and especially the relationship with uh, with our police force. Um, this, this is another example of uh, uh, an area where lots of data science um, can uh, can can bring insights that help to understand what the problems are, um, and and hopefully how we can find them. Um, that uh, the the plot on the right here shows that uh, even though you know rates of police uh, uh, or the amount of police shooting is is much higher in larger cities, the the rates of police shootings uh, is actually much higher in smaller communities. So uh, just a, a simple example here from from this nice review paper in Nature, um, showing how. Uh, Data science can can help to identify uh, problems and and where we might need to intervene most uh, or or be most most effective with our interventions um, as we try and carry them out. Uh, another example that, uh, that that I think is uh, particularly interesting 
uh, is from the uh, New York City Controller's Office uh, that uh, there uh, was an example of uh, a person who happened to be a, an engineer at Google who had a, a tree branch fall on him um, and was actually hurt quite a bit, uh, had, had brain damage as well as paralysis. Um, and uh, and uh, filed a lawsuit with the city. Um, they eventually settled for uh, a little over uh, eleven million dollars, um, and uh, and and this was was really unfortunate. Um, but the uh, the person who was in charge of the, those lawsuits, the the controller uh, in New York City, um, is a a big data science uh, proponent, um, and. Uh, and put to, had a team put together an app um, tracking the lawsuits uh, throughout New York City uh, across all sorts of things. Uh, this uh, in particular is the example uh, plot of uh, claims to do with trees falling down, which uh, it turns out is actually a huge problem in New York City and, and lots of people are, are injured or, or killed from, from trees falling uh, in the city. Um, and these seem like total freak one-off things if if you hear about them in the news, um, like, like this one particular story. Um, but if you actually collect the data and, and visualize it and look at the trends, you can see that this is a, a actually a, a widespread, more systematic problem. And then uh, going from uh, data to insights again, uh, one of the, the insights that they found was that uh, the the number of cases uh, was spiking in the uh, early 2010s um, uh, up until uh, 2013 when they did this analysis. Um, and it, it turns out that in 2010, they had uh, slashed their uh, tree pruning uh, budget in New York City by uh, about $2 million to, to try and save some money. Um, and it, it turns out that, uh, uh, that that ended up not only costing them far more in, in lawsuits, but, uh, but leading to... Uh, to, to much worse outcomes for uh, for a lot of uh, citizens of New York. Um, so this is one example uh, where uh, we we actually got to a, a happy outcome, and because of this data science, um, they uh, increased the the tree pruning uh, budget in New York City. Um, and uh, in 2013, when that happened, the the number of trees and tree branches that were coming down. Uh, and the injuries resulting from them, or at least the lawsuits resulting from them, uh, dropped dramatically. So uh, the, the the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, these systematic problems that, that we have in our society um, are uh, egregious uh, from single examples and stories. Um, but uh, but each of these anecdotal stories really uh, don't tell us a lot about the the underlying fundamental issues or, or how we can go about solving them necessarily. Uh, but with the the data science and the the big data that we're collecting, um, I, I think we have opportunities to uh, make valuable contributions to uh, to really important systematic problems um, that uh, that might otherwise go unnoticed in our society. Uh, hopefully, like uh, like racial and demographic and gender biases, um, hopefully uh, like like uh, health issues around the pandemic, um, and and I'd also uh, say that that an area I'm personally really interested in uh, is uh, is uh, preventative medicine too. That it's you know really hard to uh, look at the examples of people who never get sick and uh, and and say uh, you know whether or not. Uh, that that was a good outcome or not, but uh, with all the data that we're collecting about uh, our our own health and and our healthcare system, um, th those are questions that that we can actually uh, ask and and find ways to uh, incentivize uh, doctors and clinicians to uh, you know not only make the the right diagnoses uh, when someone's sick, but also for our system as a whole to uh, to try and help people uh, be healthier and and stay out of hospitals in general. Um, and I think there, there's lots of examples of these where, uh, where these widespread and, and especially preventative uh, issues are, um, are, are really only uh, brought to light when we uh, look at the big data behind them. So I, I'm going to quickly go over a, uh, a, an example of one of these uh, data science life cycles. Uh, again, an example from, uh, from Jim's, Jim's class uh, that, that I think is really interesting. Uh, this one happens to be with uh, Twitter. Um, 
so uh, here in the, the Vermont Complex System Center, the Twitter is uh, one of the big data sets that, uh, that we rely on often, uh, especially uh, Chris Danforth and, and Peter Dodds at the Computational Story Lab. Um, but, uh, but we in general have a, a 10% uh, of Twitter streaming into, uh, into the Complex System Center every day. Um, and, and so, so Twitter is uh, one of the examples of um, uh, of, a, of a data set that we rely on often. So uh, this particular problem, though, was uh, was investigated at Twitter, um, and uh, and was looking at a, an important business problem for them, which is uh, is uh, how their product was being used. Um, so in particular, the the character limit on uh, Twitter of 140. Uh, seems uh, maybe somewhat arbitrary and, and somewhat limited. So uh, that, that's something that they chose to investigate. That was their, uh, their business application. Um, it's uh, important to, to understand in this context and, and interesting, I think, to think about where the, uh, the 140 characters comes from. Um, if this was a live session, I'd, uh, I'd ask for lots of ideas. Um, but uh, we're, we're look, talking about uh, old school Twitter here, um, which uh, looked a lot different than it does now. Um, and, and in particular, uh, was based off of uh, sending text messages um, to, to cell phones through uh, SMS. Um, and, and one of the, uh, the limitations of, uh, of this uh, protocol is that uh, text messages are limited to uh, a certain amount of bits. Uh, and it turns out that the uh, the number of characters you can represent uh, in a text message is uh, 140. So uh, given that uh, 140 characters is uh, a historical cutoff now that we have uh, not only text through phone service, but also uh, data in uh, pretty much everyone's cell phone, um, the, the character limit is even more pertinent to, to investigate because it's something we could change uh, or, or they could change. Um, so, uh, so next uh, is to think of a, a, an idea of uh, how you might get a, about testing this question with data and the question of uh, if uh, tweets are being cut off too short. Um, one maybe straightforward thing to ask is how long are, are people's tweets? That's something that, that we have a, a lot of data about. And bringing this back into the, the scientific method, as we talked about earlier, um, we, we should have a, a null hypothesis um, and an experimental hypothesis. Um, so our, our experimental or our alternate hypothesis, uh, or sorry, our, our null hypothesis here is that uh, if tweets are too short, um, then, uh, then people will have plenty of room to, to get all of their messages in and, uh, and no one will be bumping up against the character limit. Uh, if we think about what the outcome to assess if this hypothesis is successful or not, um, you, you can see, uh, you know, or, or you can imagine lots of different examples of plots um, that, that have a, a low number of tweets. Uh, the, the first one uh, suggesting that, uh, you know, the, the shorter tweets are more common, uh, the, the second one might be suggesting that there's a, you know, a sweet spot um, where, where most people tend to, to tweet messages of. Um, but uh, again, that, that, that relatively few people max out their tweets. Uh, the alternate hypothesis that, that says uh, you know, something's wrong here um, is that people uh, are trying to cram as, as many characters into their tweets as possible. Um, and, and most of them uh, come right up against the, uh, the 140 character limit. Um, so we, we have a, a problem, we have an idea of how to look at it, and, and now we have uh, uh, an assessment to tell uh, which of our hypotheses about this problem is, is true or false. So the, the next thing to do is to, to look at the data. Yeah, there, there's lots of, of data processing that, that goes behind this. Um, but uh, luckily, the, the nice folks at Twitter have done that for us. Um, and, and we can skip right to the, uh, the visualization um, and analysis step. Uh, so looking at the actual uh, number of tweets that, that you might expect to see, um, or, or that you actually do see, um, 
we see uh, a peak early on uh, around 34 characters um, where uh, where we have a spike but the the most common uh, number of tweets that uh, or number of characters that someone puts in a tweet is 140 so uh, so it seems as though uh, a large portion of people actually are cramming up right to uh, the the size limit so uh, at, at first glance uh, we've answered our problem uh, yes uh, the the tweets or the yeah the the capacity of tweets probably is too short um, But uh, there's there's uh, lots of follow-up analysis you might think about uh, if if you came to that conclusion. Um, so, for example, uh, is is this cramming towards the end uh, something that's inevitable? Um, so, if we were if Twitter were to change the the limits to how many characters could fit in a tweet, would we always just find that people cram as much information into them as we can? That, uh, that folks start trying to write emails um, in their uh, status updates. Um, and, and that, uh, again, is a, an important uh, business question for Twitter because it, it helps inform uh, if they're going to make a, a change in their product, what, uh, what the new limit should be. So uh, this is a, a hard thing to uh, assess with the current 140 character limit uh, that they had at the time. Uh, but there's a, a nice natural experiment uh, that, they, that can be asked. Um, so, so natural experiments are, are an example of cases where uh, just by chance uh, there already happen to be uh, two, um, two different uh, subsets of data that, uh, that allow us to ask an experimental question rather than, uh, than an observational question. Um, without having to impose experimental treatments on our, our data set or our subjects. Um, this is often done um, with, uh, with before and after, uh, after some new policy or event is put in place, um, or, or especially after uh, some, some, uh, some condition happens that's uh, uh, unrelated or not, uh, not imposed by the scientists. Um, they'll, they'll use those two data sets to, to ask a, a, a treat, uh, ask a, a, a hypothesis between those two treatments. So uh, the, the natural experiment here in Twitter is, uh, is Japanese. Um, so uh, in, in Japanese, uh, it turns out that uh, almost none of the, the tweets max out their character limit. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the the mode here is is much less at just uh, just 15 characters um, per tweet, um, which tells us that uh, it's not always the case that that with unlimited capacity, people will uh, will simply max out uh, the 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 number of characters that they try to cram in. Um, and uh, the the reason for this uh, not being a, a Japanese speaker. Um, it's just that uh, in, in terms of characters or, or symbols, um, Japanese is, is much more information dense than English is. Um, and, and this, uh, of course, varies uh, by language, um, given uh, the, the average number of characters um, per tweet that we see here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you, you might even expect uh, more uh, people to be cramming up against the 140 character limit in Spanish um, than, than in English, um, given that uh, that it takes more letters to convey the same information, uh, as you can see in the, the picture of uh, the same tweet translated. So uh, this uh, this was the uh, business insight, and uh, and actually the. Uh, actionable recommendation that, that came out of that data science project at Twitter. Um, and, and as a result, uh, they doubled the size of the, the capacity of tweets um, from 140 to, uh, to 220 uh, in 2017, right after uh, this, this project was, was taken on by them. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as we see here, uh, it turns out that uh, the the hypothesis that people wouldn't always um, cram tweets regardless of size uh, happened to, to hold true um, with with Twitter, uh, at least at that time. Um, 
Uh, I'm guessing that uh, that baselines have adjusted uh, as people get used to longer and longer tweets now. Um, but uh, but this is a, an example of uh, the, the data science uh, identifying a problem and a, a solution. Um, and at least it, immediately it appears that the, the fix proposed um, actually did change the problem of people running out of space for their tweets. So uh, to, to bring all of this home, uh, the, the cycle that, um, that we see here um, in, in this example from Twitter uh, follows many of the, the major steps that we talked about earlier um, uh, of asking a question. Um, uh, that, that has um, business importance, um, that, that has uh, a specific um, actionable outcome, and, and that has data that can support it. Um, the, the, uh, given that the, the data is in place, uh, we, we move to the, the science part of this, which is uh, coming up with a, a null and alternative hypothesis about what we think our data might look, at, look like. Uh, this isn't always the case. Uh, sometimes the exploratory data analysis in itself is uh, is the outcome of a, a data science project. Uh, when when someone doesn't necessarily have a, a specific question that they're uh, that they're dealing with, but really just want to know uh, maybe what their customer base looks like, um, or uh, you know what uh, what trends they might see in um, some genomic assay or or in some um, uh, some social system of, of animals um, that, that sometimes uh, there, there aren't specific hypotheses, but, but if there are, we can go through uh, and, and perform data science to test those hypotheses um, or, to, uh, or to uncover trends in the data. Um, and, and either way, uh, the exploratory or the, uh, the convergent driven um, data science will lead to, to some insight. Uh, that tells us something we hopefully didn't know, or uh, or if we did know, wanted to confirm about our data, um, and uh, and lastly to to bring it home, um, again has some actionable consequence in in the real world, um, where uh, because of the insight you found, um, some uh, something or some decision making process um, changed for hopefully the better. Um, and in this case, that uh, that Twitter changed one of its uh, biggest policies uh, about what tweets look like. Um, so hopefully this was this was uh, insightful and helpful for you to to kind of walk through uh, a, a pretty simple example of uh, at least the thought process that goes behind a data science project, um, and and how a data scientist might interact with data. Um, now I, I know that we uh, skipped entirely over the uh, the meat and bones of uh, what uh, data analysis um, actually looks like, um, and and we'll start to get into that next week as we uh, review our uh, the our statistics that that go into data science, um, and and following that we will uh, we'll turn to programming and actually um, building uh, building some of these tools. Um, and, and some of these pipelines. Uh, so, so that's it for today. Thanks for, uh, for checking out the lecture and uh, I'll see you um, soon to uh, go over any Q&A. Have a good one, guys.